So I think the, the clock is about to strike five past five and uh, we have some attendees with us. Welcome to you all. Um, thank you for joining our seminar for the Centre of Southeast Asian Studies. And uh, it's with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker for this evening, Professor Anne Booth, Emeritus Professor of Economics at SOAS. Um, and although Emeritus is still extremely active and uh, playing a big part um, in, the, in, in, the, in the study of Southeast Asian economics, um, particularly grateful to Anne for being on the editorial board for the Journal of Southeast Asia Research as one of it, I think, one of our most long-standing members. Um, so, uh, Anne, can I invite you to share your screen again? Um, right. Thanks very much, Rachel. Um, I'll try and keep the presentation down to about 30 to 40 minutes, partly because uh, really this is very much work in progress. And I suspect some of you who are watching probably will know rather more about what's going on in at least some of the countries in, in the region that, than I do. So in a way, I'm uh, anxious to get feedback, comments um, quite clearly. Yeah, I want to start off by looking at the data that we have on the severity uh, of the COVID pandemic in Southeast Asia, make a few fairly obvious comparative uh, points, uh, and then move on to look at what we know so far about the impact, um, particularly, of course, on issues relating to living standards, poverty, employment across the region. Um, one thing we can say with a fair degree of confidence, and it's fairly clear after a year of debate and some controversy about the impact of the pandemic on this large and spread out region of now about at least 660 million people, uh, perhaps a few million more than that. Uh, it's very clear, first of all, that indeed, as we would expect, infections and death rates vary very considerably uh, across the region. In terms of numbers of cases and numbers of deaths, Indonesia and the Philippines seem now to be the most seriously affected countries. Now, in a way, that's not surprising because they're the two largest countries in terms of population. Uh, but if you look at the Johns Hopkins figures, which seem now to be widely accepted as the most reliable available, and the BBC website has done a fairly good job over the last few months, um, showing these figures, it's fairly clear that deaths relative to population are still quite low in Indonesia and the Philippines and indeed other countries, uh, certainly compared with Europe, North America, uh, and a number of countries in South America. Come back and look or speculate about some of the reasons for this, but um, it is worth bearing in mind that at least according to public perception, um, these countries in Southeast Asia aren't or haven't been uh, so seriously affected uh, as many others, certainly uh, in the, what we would term the developed world, but also, of course, uh, in parts of South America and indeed some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, it's worth pointing out that although the figures um, in Indonesia and the Philippines are low, as I said, by European standards, um, they're still a bit higher than India. Now, in this country, we tend to hear a lot more about what's going on in India, uh, certainly than Indonesia and the Philippines. Uh, and perhaps that's unfortunate, because actually when one looks at the Indian data, uh, the deaths relative to population are still quite low. It doesn't mean to say that they're not high, particularly in some regions. And of course, a lot has been uh, said about particularly Maharashtra, the city of Mumbai. Um, but we've got to look at uh, the subcontinent as a whole. And there the evidence suggests, uh, as I say, that deaths relative to population are still lower, at least, uh, than in Indonesia or the Philippines. If one looks at the rankings now, Indonesia seems to be about number 17 uh, in terms of numbers of deaths. Um, again, these are the Johns Hopkins figures. Uh, but of course, they're much lower when deaths are standardized for population. Um, however, and this is worrying, the numbers uh, of deaths um, are continuing to grow. 
um, as indeed they are in the Philippines. Uh, and of course, as many of you will know, a couple of weeks ago, the Philippines was put on the so-called red list for the UK, or at least for England, uh, which means people coming back from the Philippines now have to quarantine, quarantine in designated hotels. Um, and that may well happen for Indonesia. Um, Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Myanmar have all reported well over 100,000 deaths. But in other parts of the region, um, the numbers uh, of reported cases are much lower. And mortality is still fairly low, certainly by global standards. In fact, uh, in Vietnam, uh, sorry, just let me go back for a minute. Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Brunei, and Singapore, they've all reported fewer than 100 deaths, although Thailand, the numbers have been edging up a bit, particularly over the last week. I think they've got to 100. Now, of course, all these figures have to be queried. Is the underreporting of both cases and deaths? My own view is that's probably quite likely, and particularly in those countries or regions within countries uh, where vital registration, particularly outside the larger cities, is fairly weak, testing capacity is limited. Uh, and governments um, might not, sorry, might not wish to publish accurate figures, even if they have them. And of course, many do not. Um, in addition, we have to bear in mind that in those countries, or again, regions within countries where access to modern medical facilities, hospitals and well-equipped clinics is still quite limited. I think it's highly likely that people are dying at home uh, and the deaths are simply not registered in the COVID statistics. We have to bear all this in mind. I know, at least in Indonesia, there's some controversy now about the data, but I think it's highly likely this is also the case uh, in other parts of the region as well. As well. It's also been pointed out that there are, in fact, other reasons why COVID deaths appear to have been rather lower not just in Southeast Asia, but also other parts of Asia and indeed uh, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, compared with Europe and North and South America. One reason that a number of people have pointed to, and my own view is it's a fairly important one, uh, is that the demographic structure is simply different. And when we look at uh, the available demographic data on Southeast Asia, we see immediately uh, a much higher proportion of the population is under 50. Now, if there's one thing I think we have learned over the, the last year, this virus seems to affect older people, particularly over the age of 60, much more seriously. And in fact, many young people, uh, even if they're infected by the virus, they don't seem to show many symptoms uh, and they don't seem to be seriously ill, certainly not ill enough uh, to need hospital care. Another point we need to bear in mind is by and large, of course, <clears throat> the elderly are mainly looked after at home. Care homes are really still pretty much unknown in many parts of Southeast Asia, indeed many parts of the Asian region as a whole. And as we know, of course, uh, in Europe, certainly during the so-called first wave, a very high proportion of the deaths took place among uh, frail elderly people in care homes. Another point that's quite often made, uh, particularly about tropical or subtropical countries, is the warmer climate does lead to a more open air lifestyle. People aren't closeted uh, in closed houses to the same extent. Now it's true, streets of course, and indeed very often houses are crowded, but it's argued, well, there's better ventilation, air circulates, uh, and as we know again, um, from what we've learned in Europe over the last year, infection rates do tend to be higher uh, when large numbers of people are closeted together uh, in closed spaces. Some people have pointed out, well, obesity may be a less serious problem, particularly among older folk. Uh, and we know, of course, obesity is associated with higher death rates, certainly in Europe. On the other hand, of course, many men smoke. Um, and probably uh, more women smoke than in fact admit to in the statistics. Uh, and uh, smoking and associated lung problems 
are certainly correlated with, with higher deaths in Europe, and I suspect elsewhere. Some people have argued that the government policy responses in Southeast Asia, while limited, have been reasonably effective, at least in enforcing lockdowns uh, and restricting national and international travel. Now, as I point out in the moment, this has had pretty serious impacts on several economies in the region, particularly Malaysia and Thailand, lesser extent, Indonesia and the Philippines, tour foreign tourists, uh, numbers have fallen. Uh, and of course, that's had a, a very serious impact uh, on the economies of those countries. So far, and this is a point I'll come back to, but progress with vac vaccination appears to have been limited, uh, particularly in the larger countries. We come back again to the problems in Indonesia, Thailand, uh, and perhaps some of the other countries in the region. Now, another point that's been made, um, and some of you listening might have some thoughts on this, but I know it has been argued that variants of the COVID-19 virus have in fact been circulating in, in some parts of Asia, particularly Southern China and the countries in mainland Southeast Asia that border on Southern China uh, for some years, possibly even decades. And this might have generated some herd immunity among populations, which in turn has led to lower infection rates in Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, even Thailand. Uh, perhaps Man, Myanmar as well. Um, and of course, this might also explain what appeared to be rather low death rates in China itself, and also Taiwan, Korea. All this is fairly speculative, and clearly a lot more research is needed. Uh, it would be helpful if the Chinese were a little more forthcoming uh, about how exactly um, the virus spread from southern China to central China, of course, particularly to the city of Wuhan. Um, I think one also has to bear in mind, and I know that quite a few doctors have made this point over the last year, uh, there's still an awful lot about the way the human immune system works by region, by ethnic group, by age group, that we still don't understand. Okay, well, what's been the economic impact? Now, of course, economists tend first and foremost to look at GDP data. We're now in a position where we've got reasonably good data uh, for most of the countries in the region on the impact uh, of the virus and the pandemic and the associated lockdowns and so on on GDP. And the first point and the most important point is to say that there seems to have been a very considerable variation across the countries in the region. I think it's now widely agreed the worst affected country, at least in terms of GDP decline, has been the Philippines. A decline of almost 10%, which is pretty much what happened in this country, in the UK, and some of the badly affected countries in Europe, such as Spain, for example, Italy, uh, and a few others. Now, why was the Philippines so badly affected? Well, I'll come back to that in a moment. There's been some speculation uh, but in my view, I find the Philippine data rather puzzling. Thailand also has experienced a fairly severe contraction, but over 6%. Malaysia, a little under 6%. Singapore, roughly the same. Indonesia, where to begin with, people were fairly pessimistic uh, about this time last year, with there were some fairly grim predictions being made about the likely decline uh, in GDP, I think based probably now quite fallaciously on the experience of Indonesia during the so-called Asian crisis in 98, 99. But in fact, the data seemed to suggest contraction in GDP was only of the order of about 2%, much the same as Cambodia. And then we've got a group of countries led by Vietnam where in fact, GDP has continued to expand admittedly at a lower rate, certainly in the case of Vietnam and Myanmar, uh, than had been up until uh, 2020. But Vietnam, you can see uh, the rate of growth of GDP now is put at about 3%, and Myanmar a little under 2%. Brunei, well, the 
government is reporting a slight expansion under 1%. I haven't really been able to get figures yet for Laos. Um, somebody may be able to help me there. Um, but I think it's likely that Laos, Laos uh, probably had a contraction, same order of magnitude as Cambodia. Okay, well, why these differences? Uh, and I think at the moment, certainly most people, certainly I've spoken to or interacted with, agree that it's really quite difficult to explain why there has been uh, such a big difference, at least in terms of GDP contraction. Um, the contraction in the Philippines is worth pointing out much greater than the Asian crisis. Uh, those of you whose memory stretch back to the late 1990s will remember that uh, in several countries in the region, uh, GDP declined by a considerably greater amount. In the case of Indonesia, it was almost a 13% decline in 1998, much worse uh, than what appears to have uh, occurred in 2020. Um, the Philippines, and here there's the interesting contrast, um, the Philippines was actually not that badly affected by the Asian crisis. Uh, and certainly uh, now most Philippine economists are pointing out that the contraction in 2020 was probably the worst that the Philippine economy has experienced since uh, the bad days in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. Well, one reason why this has happened, I think, is the contraction of what national income accountants like to call uh, net primary income from abroad, which um, at least according to preliminary estimates I've seen, contracted by over 50%. Now that is largely, not entirely, but largely due to the fallen remittances. And as many of you know, who've been studying the Philippines, uh, remittances have in recent years, mainly remittances from Filipinos working abroad, uh, they've played a, a very important role uh, in the economy. Um, now, the Philippines did actually have reasonably robust growth in national income over the decade up until 2019. Um, some people are, sorry, let me go back for a minute. Some people are projecting uh, a recovery, quite a rapid recovery uh, in the Philippines in this year, 2021. Um, at the moment, I must say I'm a bit cautious, partly because I still don't fully understand the reason for this very serious growth collapse last year. Uh, and until we know a bit more about those reasons, I think it's difficult to make projections. Uh, I think it's highly likely there will be a return to growth, uh, but just how large, it's very difficult at the moment, at least in my view, uh, to predict. Uh, now, Vietnam, as we all know, certainly those of us that have been looking at the region over the last um, uh, few years, um, will know that Vietnam has become something of the regional superstar in terms of, of rapid growth. Um, the 3% predicted for, or 3%, um, uh, which has been um, uh, estimated for last year for 2020, was a considerable drop over the rates of growth that they've been achieving uh, for much of the last decade, indeed really for longer, seven, eight, even 9% per annum in some years. Um, Vietnam's a bit like, more like China, I think, than the other uh, countries in the region, uh, in that there are now quite bullish predictions for a return to growth uh, this year. And it's worth bearing in mind, Vietnam's trade links with the other ASEAN countries have until recently been relatively limited. Um, and I think many people are saying, well, Vietnam's in some ways a very globalized economy, far more of course than was the case 20 years ago. Uh, so it will uh, benefit from a recovery in the, US, uh, the USA and other OECD economies, uh, as well as in China itself. When we turn to look at the contractions in Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, um, well, as I said, the sharp decline in tourism and transport se uh, services uh, has been one reason. Uh, and I think certainly in the case of Thailand, Malaysia, a serious reason. 
Uh, in addition, um, all these countries are plugged into global production networks, um, both in manufacturing uh, uh, and also uh, in some uh, service, con uh, service sectors. Uh, they've been hit obviously by declining uh, demand for a range of manufacturers in 2020. Uh, Singapore and Malaysia in particular are projecting reasonably high growth rates for this year, 2021. They clearly feel that as fairly open economies or very open economies in those two cases, um, the recovery will depend uh, on a return to growth in the global economy. And the most recent estimates uh, by the IMF have been reasonably optimistic here. Uh, and of course, both USA and China will play an important role uh, in pushing uh, global growth this year and probably for two or three years to come at least. Um, turn to Thailand, the projections are less optimistic. Now it's worth bearing in mind that actually Thailand hasn't been doing terribly well in terms of GDP growth uh, for the last decade, actually really for the last two decades. Uh, it was badly hit by the Asian crisis and never really managed to get back to the sort of stellar growth uh, levels that were achieved uh, in the 1980s, 1990s. Um, most of the predictions I've seen for Thailand are of the order of 2.5 to 3.5%, not very dramatic. Um, in the case of Indonesia, as I said, the contraction turned out to be rather less than some people had feared. Um, now this again may reflect the fact that Indonesia is somewhat less open economy than certainly Thailand, Malaysia or Singapore. Also uh, the agricultural mineral sectors still account for about 20% of total GDP and they've been fairly resilient. Um, and agricultural output, in fact, has continued to grow through 2020, um, at least partly because of the fairly strong performance of some agricultural exports, palm oil, of course, in particular. Some people think that the stimulus package the Indonesian government implemented uh, last year um, has played a role, although others think it was a fairly small package and probably didn't have a very dramatic effect. Growth projections for Indonesia for 2021 vary. Um, a report came out uh, on Indonesia from the OECD a few weeks ago, which suggests that growth might be of the order of 4%. Some people, I'm, I've seen other estimates which are a bit lower. Okay, well, let's turn to issues relating to um, the uh, impact on poverty. And this is serious. Now, again, those of you with memories that go back to the late 1990s, the so-called Asian crisis, will remember there was a very serious impact on poverty levels, although recovery tended to be faster, even in the worst affected economies uh, than some people had predicted. And I think it's almost inevitable when you look at the extent of the GDP declines that have taken place in 2020, there's going to be some impact on household incomes and therefore on poverty levels. Um, let's start with the Philippines. I said the worst affected country in terms of uh, GDP decline. Um, the Philippines does what are called the FIES, Family Income and Expenditure Surveys, every three years. These are considered to be reasonably good household surveys, although some people uh, criticize them for underestimating uh, household incomes and expenditures, particularly in the richer groups. Um, but however good or bad they are, um, a, a, a complete FIS is not going to be available until this year. Uh, so what we have at the moment is quite a lot of speculation uh, on the part of uh, various NGOs uh, about what they think might have happened to poverty and living standards. Uh, one sees press stories, for example, that the numbers of families going hungry has doubled, uh, certainly between September 2019 and May 2020. 
uh, a well-known NGO that does um, public opinion polling, Social Weather Station, has reported, uh, in fact, in November 2020, only about 16% of families in the whole country uh, rated those uh, as uh, non-poor. Um, does that mean the other 84% are poor? Possibly not. And, you know, these self-rating exercises are criticized by some economists. But certainly so far, the evidence does suggest that uh, a decline in GDP of around about 10%, a little under, will have a serious impact on poverty uh, and living standards uh, across much of the country. The Thai figures are also quite in interesting. Um, Thailand has been producing its own poverty figures in recent years based on its uh, based on household expenditure, uh, household income and expenditure surveys that are carried out now on an annual basis. Um, some figures I've seen, they come from the World Bank, but I think they're just repeating uh, figures from the National Statistical Office in Bangkok. They suggest numbers of poor increased from 3.7 million to about 5.2 million um, between 2019 and 2020. Now that's a fairly considerable increase, about 40%. Um, which is worrying, and I'm sure it must be worrying the Thai government, uh, given the other um, political and social problems that Thailand is, is facing at the moment. Um, however, it does need to be borne in mind, the Thai government has tended in recent years to use a fairly high poverty line, uh, certainly higher than the Indonesian one, for example. Um, and it's possible uh, that if one used the lower poverty line, for example, uh, closer to the one the World Bank, the so-called dollar ninety that the World Bank has been using uh, using in recent years, uh, the numbers in poverty um, will certainly be lower, but they also might have increased less rapidly. Still, I, I find the Thai figures moderately worrying, and as I said, um, they must be leading to some concern in Thailand, given all the other problems, political and social and constitutional, uh, that the Thai government's facing at the moment. Okay, well, turning to Indonesia, Statistics Indonesia, the National Statistical Agency, published in January uh, some numbers which uh, showed that um, uh, numbers below the official poverty line increased from a little under 25 million uh, in um, uh, September 2019 uh, to about 27.5 million uh, in September 20. Um, now this didn't necessarily translate into a very large increase in the poverty ratio in the proportion of the population. We must bear in mind Indonesia has got a very large population, at least 270 million. Um, however, the absolute increase uh, is I think worrying and certainly enough to present a challenge to the government. Since the so-called Asian crisis of the late 1990s, Indonesia has been uh, pushing forward with a number of so-called social safety net programs, programs that are really intended to try and help um, the poorer segments of the population, um, boost their incomes and certainly boost uh, school attendance, attendance at, uh, at health centers and so on. Um, the government certainly has announced an increase in, in some of these programs. Um, I think one of the interesting things about the Indonesian figures is that it seems that a lot of uh, the increase in the numbers of poor have actually taken place in urban areas. Uh, in other words, um, that's where Unemployment has been rising, or apparently rising quite rapidly. Uh, a number of people, probably young people, often migrants from rural areas, are losing whatever jobs they had. Uh, and it's been argued, well, many of them will just go home again, and uh, they will tend to depress living standards in rural areas, depress wages, perhaps, certainly become more of a burden on their families. And that may well happen. Um, some people are arguing, well, poverty will spring back, uh, will decline again in 2021. 
Um, but I think if, if the problem is being pushed slowly from urban to rural areas, uh, perhaps this may not happen. What you might get in, in turn is a decline in poverty rates in urban areas and a rise uh, in rural areas. Um, turning back to Thailand, I know some projections have been made that at least 5 million will still be below the poverty line this year in 2021, um, which I think is worrying. As I said earlier, I'm sure this is worrying uh, the Thai government, given all the other problems uh, that it's having to deal with at the moment. Okay, well, let's make some fairly tentative conclusions. The first, uh, and this is an important one, is that the pandemic has exposed weaknesses uh, in social services, and particularly public health infrastructure. Uh, now, some of these weaknesses were already fairly well known um, to international agencies and indeed experts in public health uh, in the region. Uh, but perhaps unfortunately, they didn't necessarily get as much attention from domestic policy makers as, as they should have. Um, now, government spending on public health varies across the region. Um, broadly speaking, uh, facilities tend to be better in urban areas, uh, and certainly most skilled professionals, doctors, nurses, uh, and so on, have concentrated in urban areas. Uh, there seems to be fairly good evidence in many parts of the region that private facilities have been expanding, um, particularly to meet increased demand from the urban middle classes, because quite simply, many people tend to feel uh, that public facilities are of a rather poor quality. However, private care, of course, tends to be more expensive. Uh, some people get it as part of their uh, remuneration package. It's true of both public and uh, uh, people in public employment, but also in the private sector. Uh, but many simply have to pay out of their incomes uh, for whatever private care they can afford. One other factor that's had a certain amount of attention in recent years is the growth and cross-border provision of medical services. Many Indonesians, for example, middle-class Indonesians are going to Malaysia uh, for treatments rather than use local facilities. Again, this reflects the fact that they don't think the local facilities are very good. Um, and perhaps ironically, in at least some cases, uh, treatments available in Malaysia cost less uh, than in a private facility in Indonesia. Attitudes to vaccination also vary. They vary a lot across regions, across social classes, a lot across religious groups. Come back and look at the vaccination issue a little bit more detail in a moment. But so far, very few countries have embarked on what one would term mass vaccination campaigns. I'm not so sure about Singapore, although I suspect now um, uh, certainly the more vulnerable groups are being vaccinated, and that may be the case in Malaysia. Uh, the Indonesian government has claimed that it wishes to vaccinate all adults. Um, that's about 180 million people, probably more. Uh, but it's, of course, having difficulty, particularly in getting enough vaccines. Uh, it's also argued that delivery, even if they can get the vaccines, is not going to be that easy, particularly outside the larger cities, um, to um, uh, vaccinate people given the lack of facilities, lack of trained um, staff and so on. Uh, at the moment, Indonesia seems to be depending very much, <clears throat> very much on China. Uh, for its vaccines, that may change. Um, but certainly Indonesia and the Philippines uh, have not been able to source many vaccines from Western countries or indeed from India. One other thing I'd like to draw attention to, uh, you can call it the reversal of fortune if you like. Certainly, as I said earlier, Indonesia, uh, Vietnam seems to have emerged uh, as the star performer. Growth rates were high, certainly in the decade, uh, up until 2019, and Vietnam seems to have coped uh, very well uh, as far as dealing with COVID cases and, and COVID deaths. 
And that may partly re reflect the fact that, as I said earlier, uh, the population uh, may have more natural immunity. Um, what is happening, and I think this is really very interesting, so just let me go back for a moment. Uh, what is happening is that GDP per capita now in Vietnam, uh, if you to use the uh, World Bank IMF figures, corrected for purchasing power parity, uh, seems now to be higher than in the Philippines. Um, in fact, some of the figures I've seen uh, suggest higher by at least $2,000. Uh, now, for those of us who remember the uh, Vietnam in the early 1990s, and it was still a low income country. Uh, that's really a remarkable achievement, but of course it also throws light on the relatively poor performance, um, not just of the Philippine economy, but some of the others in the region as well. As I said earlier, Indonesia has performed slightly better than might have been expected, um, certainly given the problems, and they are serious problems in my view, with the provision of health services. However, I do think it's likely that excess deaths in the Philippines when uh, reliable data becomes available uh, will be much higher than the official data show. And indeed, we might not really know the full figure, uh, the full picture for Indonesia, at least until we get uh, the intercensal survey of 2025. Uh, and it might also be the case that we won't get accurate data for other countries in the region, including Laos, Cambodia, Myanmar, uh, until uh, more complete population uh, data are available. My suspicion is that excess deaths in all these countries are higher than the official figures show. Um, as far as the Philippines is concerned, I think the serious collapse this year in GDP has exposed weaknesses in its economic strategy. Now, the government at the moment seems to be counting on a rapid recovery this year. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. There's another set of issues, of course, to do with the role of China, the whole question of the relationship between ASEAN and China is now getting quite a lot of attention. Um, and I think on the whole, uh, as a result of the pandemic, uh, China's role in the region may well be enhanced, not just as a trading partner, but also as a, a sort of reliable friend in need. And I think this is particularly the case with supplying vaccines, possibly other medical aid as well. And I'd like to finish, if I might, just by drawing attention to some figures which have been published. Um, those of you with an interest in health issues may know these, uh, these data. Um, they've been put out now, they're called global health metrics. They've been put out now for some years by a group uh, based at the University of Washington in Seattle. Being in Seattle, of course, they get a lot of assistance, I think, uh, from the Gates Foundation. But this is a really very ambitious attempt to put together uh, health metrics uh, for a very large number of countries, also almost 200 um, across not just the developed world, but also the developing world, including Sub-Saharan Africa. And one measure they've been estimating is often referred to as hail that just uh, refers to health adjusted life expectancies now of course some of you will know uh, if we look at the um, some of the composite indicators of development that have been used for example the uh, human development index which the united nations has been using now for many years uh, life expectancy at, at birth is one component of the HDI, but uh, these people have gone rather further. What they're trying to do is adjust life expectancy uh, for problems and particularly uh, problems um, which many countries are now facing, which is a poor quality of life uh, of older folk. Um, in addition, they've tried to estimate the impact, for example, in the United States of problems like opioid addiction uh, and some of the associated health problems uh, related to that. So in other words, they're estimating life expectancies, but adjusting them uh, for these health problems. Well, what do we see? Well, actually we see, and they've uh, put out the data now uh, for 
a number of um, years, but I've given the figures here for 1990 and 2016. Now, over this 26 years, of course, this is before the pandemic hit, and there's a fair amount of discussion now about what impact the pandemic will have on life expectancies uh, across the world. But prior to the pandemic, we can see it was a, a fairly impressive increase at the global level in life expectancies adjusted for health and uh, outcomes. Singapore, perhaps not surprisingly, given it's uh, by far the richest country in the region, has the best outcomes. In fact, I think Singapore has among the best outcomes for any country in the world. Women in Singapore now can expect uh, to live for over 80 years, but it's estimated that at least 75 of those 80 years will be fairly healthy. In fact, very healthy. Probably uh, people uh, will not be affected by uh, the familiar problems of uh, the very old dementia, Parkinson's and other uh, problems. So Singapore comes out top. Um, also, Brunei, another fairly well to do country, which has invested a fair amount in health, uh, Malaysia. Thailand actually looks surprisingly good. And I, I think this is an aspect of Thai economic progress over the last 20 years or so that perhaps hasn't, hasn't had as much attention as it should have done. Um, famously, of course, Taxon uh, introduced the so called 30 baht healthcare policy way back, I think, in 2001, when he first uh, achieved office, was extremely popular. Uh, sorry, I want to get back again. Can I go back? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was extremely popular. And although uh, Taxon uh, was deposed in 26, and uh, his uh, uh, successors, including his sister, uh, were, of course, pushed out in 2014, uh, I think successive governments since then have uh, invested more in healthcare. Uh, and certainly it's now showing up uh, in these health adjusted life expectancy figures. Thai women now can expect to live 70 years, and that's 70 years of healthy life, uh, obviously lower than Singapore, uh, but perhaps surprisingly slightly higher than Malaysia or Brunei, and certainly a lot higher than most of the other countries. Vietnam has also done well, and again, this I think is now quite widely recognized. Uh, health policies uh, in Vietnam uh, have had a lot of attention, um, although perhaps not quite as much attention as they should have had, because even if one goes back to the 1990s, uh, Vietnam was doing surprisingly well uh, in terms of uh, life expectancy. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion of why this was, and don't forget in 1990, Vietnam was still a very poor country, I mean much poorer than Thailand, poorer than Indonesia or the Philippines, and yet seems to have done relatively well uh, on some of these global health metrics. Now some people have argued, well, in 1975, when of course Vietnam was reunified after extremely bitter uh, and prolonged civil war against both the French and then the Americans. Uh, the government was faced with really uh, very serious public health problems. Many people, of course, injured. Uh, many families had lost family members. Um, and so a real effort was made to provide not just health care, but also other social services, um, particularly in rural areas. Uh, my own view is the Vietnam experience deserves some further study, not least in countries like Indonesia, where, frankly, um, health metrics are not really that good when one bears in mind Indonesia is now what the World Bank likes to call an upper middle income country. Uh, and certainly Vietnam looks good compared with the Philippines uh, and also with Laos, and Myanmar, and Cambodia. Now, the reasons for low life expectancy, particularly back in the 1990s um, in uh, Cambodia and Laos, of course, again, with the result of the uh, appalling mm -hmm. problems those countries went through in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, the Myanmar figures are also not terribly good, although they've improved somewhat 
Um, all these data, um, if you're interested, can be found in an article in The Lancet, a well-known British medical journal. journal. Um, and uh, I, I think if, if you have an interest in health issues, uh, certainly anywhere in the developing world, but I think particularly in Southeast Asia, they are worth spending a bit of time uh, looking at. As I said, this was a big project that the Gates Foundation uh, funded, and indeed I think is continuing to fund. Uh, and it does show up, uh, I think, a number of important issues related to health. Um, particularly the fairly obvious fact that some countries, even in the case of Vietnam, relatively low to medium income countries, seem to have done a lot better than others. And it's certainly, I think, worth bearing all that in mind as we come out of the pandemic and look at health policies uh, in the future. Well, okay, I'll leave it there. Sorry, how long have I I've gone on for too long, haven't I? Uh, but please, um, as I say, I'd very much welcome further comments, um, particularly um, from those of you that probably know more about at least some of these countries uh, than I do. Thank you very much, Anne, that's fantastic and really interesting, lots of great data there. Um, I'm looking in the Q&A box for questions and can't see anything yet. Can I click the box? Well, so I think you can, it's at the bottom. Yes, sir, it's bottom there, isn't it? Yeah. It as no well. open questions. Oh. No open questions yet. And I can see that my camera is slightly freezing as well. I'm going to turn it off actually to make it seem less weird. No, it's okay. Right now, is it? Okay. No, okay. Um, a nice view of the maple. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> topical, I think. <laughs> I mean, it's quite a big task, isn't it, to take on a survey of economic development across the whole region under the COVID and the influence of COVID and, and must must require you to be able to sort of take data from several different sources in order to be able to make those comparisons from one country to the next. Yeah, I, I should point out, I think I, I said earlier, um, this has been very much a sort of lockdown exercise, which means I'm very dependent on what I can get on the internet. Fortunately, most of the countries, not all, but most of the countries in the region now have fairly good um, uh, statistical data available either directly uh, from uh, national statistical agencies, and, you know, quite good websites now, and certainly Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, uh, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, as one would expect. Um, other countries are a bit more problematic. Um, and um, Sometimes one does depend on World Bank and other secondary sources, usually reasonably reliable. Uh, but in some cases, um, you know, one really is struggling a bit to find data. As I said, I'm still not completely sure what's going on in Laos. Uh, yeah. Indeed, uh, Laos has not, never been an easy country to get data for. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it uh, does mean it's rather difficult to predict what's going to happen there, although it's still, of course, a relatively small country, but you know, if you live in Laos, or indeed if you live in neighboring countries, this was something else I sort of was going to touch on, the whole question of what impact this is going to have on uh, cross-border migration. Um, of course, this worries Thailand, I know, because of the uh, possibility that, um, uh, There'll be an influx of people coming not just from Myanmar but also of course from Laos, possibly Cambodia as well. Um, actually I think if I was sitting in Bangkok at the moment I really would be quite worried uh, mm -hmm. about uh, what's going on not just in the neighbours but even in the domestic economy. Yes, yes. So we have a question from Nikki Arif now, I'll read to you Anne. Uh, fascinating Anne. I have a question about anti-Asian sentiment in the USA. How do you think this will impact on Southeast Asia's opinion slash worldview of the Western world who fared so much worse in this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a difficult question. I'm not sure I'm qualified to answer it. Um, how bad the anti-Asian sentiment really is? I mean, there have been a few isolated episodes. I'm not sure they really add up to anything 
very important. Um, probably Americans, and indeed I think this is true of many Europeans, uh, don't necessarily distinguish between China on the one hand, uh, countries such as uh, Korea and Japan, uh, and Southeast Asia. I like to think uh, in this part of the world, partly because of, of course, colonial experience, people are a little more informed about what's going on. Um, my own view is that on the whole, uh, to the extent people in Europe uh, know much about Indonesia uh, or the Philippines or indeed Vietnam, uh, they may know a bit more about Thailand and Malaysia because they go for, there for holidays. Um, but this is still a bit of an area of darkness. Uh, I'm not sure there's much anti Asian sentiment that is focused on people from these regions. It's much more just, I think, complete ignorance. Uh, and as I say, uh, I am interested looking, you know, there's a lot of coverage, certainly in this country, on India now, you know, given the historic links, plus the fact a lot of people of Indian origin now live in Britain. Uh, it's to be expected that a lot of attention will be given to India. But I don't think many people would realize that if you know one does look at deaths um, standardized for population, uh, the situation in India is certainly no worse than Indonesia or the Philippines and may in fact be a bit better. Um, now, I don't think that's going to translate into hordes of uh, uh, people trying to cross borders. There's very little evidence that that's happening at all, certainly in Indonesia or the Philippines. As I say, I think Thailand has got more to worry about, partly because of the instability uh, in Myanmar and uh, also to some extent Cambodia. Um, and of course, the coup in Myanmar has just aggravated these problems. But no, I don't, I, I wouldn't worry too much about anti Asian feeling in America. Um, and I think Biden, actually, to be fair, has, a, uh, you know, just looking at the bio data from some of his key people now, these are people that really do understand Asia uh, and understand the problems. And in several cases, have had a lot of experience in the region. Uh, so I think they can be trusted to make sensible decisions. But in the meantime, of course, you know, let's face it, uh, American policy is going to be very much focused on problems in America. European policy is going to be very much focused on problems uh, in the various European countries. I don't think anybody at the moment is really too worried about what's going on in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I'm wrong here, but that's the impression I get. Okay, we can follow up with another question from Sophie Zwick. Um, are there specific industries that are especially affected by COVID? And will they recover by developing differently than before the pandemic? Has the pandemic created a moment of rethinking the current economic trajectory? It's a very important question. It's a difficult one to answer. And as I said, the certainly tourism, if you think of tourism as being one industry, although in many ways one has to break it down into its component parts, obviously hotels and restaurants, what's broadly termed the hospitality industry. This has been very badly hit, I think, uh, across the whole region, uh, because foreigners simply are not coming. Uh, and I think local tourism uh, has largely stopped, not entirely, uh, but very large. I mean, I think, again, a bit like uh, in this country and other parts of Europe, people are just a bit scared to leave home. Uh, and as deaths mount, I think that fear will, will increase. So, you know, even if Javanese would like to go to Bali for a holiday, I suspect they're thinking twice about it. Uh, and of course, foreign, I'm told that foreign tourism to Bali now uh, has more or less ground to a halt. Uh, and I think well, you'll know the Thai story, but I'm told this is true in Thailand, Malaysia, um, and indeed other parts of the region, including, of course, Cambodia. I don't know how many people are going to Angkor now, but I suspect it's a tiny proportion. Uh, of the numbers, say, two years ago. And that'll hit Cambodia quite badly. Uh, other industries that are likely to be hurt, this, uh, you know, some people are very bullish and say, oh, you know, years time, everything will bounce back. China will start growing again. Uh, the American economy, 
uh, partly as a result of the Biden policies, uh, will bounce back. This seems to be the message that the IMF is giving at the moment. Um, if one looks at, say, garments, textiles, these are footwear, these are important industries in, in Vietnam, Cambodia. Um, they export largely, not entirely, but largely to Western Europe and North America. Uh, and they'll bounce back as demand bounces back. And I think that's probably true. But I think other industries probably are going to be more seriously affected. In the case of the Philippines, I know a lot of attention was given uh, to the growth of call centers. Um, a lot of uh, middle-class Filipinos uh, are now employed, basically answering phone calls from the United States and Canada. Um, that should also bounce back as the economies in, in these countries recover. Uh, but there may have to be some rethinking. Um, and I think that, uh, again, simply because of the severity of the decline in the Philippines, uh, I think uh, there's going to have to be some rethinking of the growth strategy there. Um, the Philippines now is, I think, facing a bit of a crisis, um, having done reasonably well for the last two decades, uh, and how they will respond. I simply don't know. I'm not, you know, even Vietnam, which seems to have done pretty well. Um, I'm told that there is now some rethinking going on, certainly uh, among, um, within the party, about whether a growth strategy that depends so much on the global economy uh, really makes sense. So it'd be interesting to see. I, I wouldn't like to make predictions, uh, but I think there is going to be some rethinking. And one does have to bear in mind, you know, the various governments in Southeast Asia are very different. I mean, Vietnam is essentially a fairly strong one party state, Communist Party dominant. Singapore, of course, as far as we know, the PAP is still dominant. Um, other countries you have got a much messier, Indonesia. Jokowi, who's coped reasonably well, I think, so far with the crisis, although he certainly had some critics. But, you know, he stands down in another, what, uh, three years. Uh, and who's going to succeed him is far from clear. Uh, who's going to succeed Duterte uh, is also far from clear in the Philippines. Uh, Malaysia is still uh, a fairly unstable um, country, although I think on the whole Malaysia's coped reasonably well with the pandemic. Um, the underlying political situation is unstable, as indeed it is in Thailand. So we are looking at a fair amount of instability across the region. And that's certainly going to affect thinking on economic policy. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. I'll move on to the next question from Ariel Lopez. Um, greetings from the Philippines. Mm. Thanks for the lecture, Professor Booth. I've been working from home since March, 2020. I'm not sure if decline in remittance is a major factor in GDP decline. I think it's it's really the hard and extended lockdowns. I'm also doubtful about the impact of China's vaccine diplomacy, especially if done with their ongoing South China Sea expansion. I guess it's a comment rather than a question. No, but th those points are very important and, and thank you. Um, you may well be right about remittances. As I said, this is uh, a response I've had from um, people here and um, other parts of Europe, uh, oh, well, you know, the Philippines has become so dependent on remittances, although that in itself, uh, I know, is a statement that not all would agree with. Um, if indeed it is simply, I'm not still not completely sure if remittances have fallen as rapidly uh, as the GDP figure figures might show. There may be other reasons as well, including inward investment flows. Um, I don't see any evidence that, that somebody told me quite recently there are well over 30,000 Filipinos working here in the NHS. Now, I don't think many of them are packing up and going home. Um, and to the extent they're still earning, they'll be sending money home as they always do. Uh, similarly, Filipinos working in other parts of Southeast Asia, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, and indeed in other parts of the world, including the United States. Um, 
so there, you may well be right. The remittance story may not be quite as important as uh, some people at the moment seem to think. I'd like to get more data. I've been sort of struggling a bit with the website, the, the Philippine Statistical Agency. It's actually a very good website, quite easy to navigate. Uh, but as yet, they haven't really put up much detailed data uh, on GDP for 2020. And uh, as more data become available, uh, it'll give us, I think, a, clear, a clearer picture uh, of what's going on. Your point about the South China Sea, also very well taken. Um, I know, uh, of course, Duterte has tended uh, to be rather pro-China, uh, although people tell me he's now in very poor health. Some people think he may not even survive till the end of his, uh, his term. And who will succeed him, as far as I can see, is still very much an open question. Um, I can imagine why Filipinos are very, Philippine, the Philippines and Vietnam is really, I think, now in the front line as far as the South China Sea is concerned. These two countries are the most affected. How they will cope, I don't know. I mean, it's clearly an enormously important element in the whole issue of China, Southeast Asia relations. Uh, and it's, it's really very difficult. I mean, the pandemic of anything has made everything more difficult to predict. As far as vaccines are concerned, I'm told that in Indonesia at the moment, almost all the available vaccines are coming from China. They were promised uh, some by AstraZeneca uh, and AstraZeneca in, in India, uh, and they haven't shown up. And I think given, I mean, we are facing now a worldwide shortage of vaccines. And I'm afraid countries like the Philippines and Indonesia are fairly low the pecking order, fairly low down in the pecking order. So they'll just have to make do with whatever's available. Um, it's a difficult situation for them to be in, but there we are, that's reality. Hmm. Yeah, harsh reality indeed. It is, yeah. I don't know, you might know, Rachel, a little bit about uh, Thailand, one hasn't heard yet about a mass vaccination program in Thailand. No. Um, uh, the government's not saying very much, is it? No, I've been asking friends what they've been offered. And I think, the, again, people have mostly been offered Sinovac. Yeah. But uh, people I've spoken to are also kind of very scared by stories about AstraZeneca. Mm. And I also hear that some of the rollout has been, you know, for private citizens only and not not widely available for... One hears this across the region. The, there's now a flourishing you private pay, market. And you get it. Um, uh, and if you can pay for it, you get it. And if you can't, well, you don't. Yeah. I think probably that's pretty... I don't, I don't see how can, this can be avoided, right? Yes. I mean, that would, that would fit in with most models of healthcare, I think. Yeah, absolutely. In Thailand and probably in the rest of Southeast Asia as well. Yeah, I, ha I have a comment from Chris Joy, uh, a comment more than a question concerning pre-existing immunity to COVID-19, especially in southern China and mainland Southeast Asia, at least from anecdotal evidence, having spent five or six winters in northern Vietnam, respiratory issues with very COVID-like symptoms are common and always fill hospitals it seems likely that COVID-like pathogens do circulate there with some frequency. Well, thanks for that comment. It's very interesting. And, you know, I've heard one or two other people say much the same thing, people with experience in, in Vietnam, even Myanmar. And Myanmar is a bit of a puzzle because all the evidence suggests, putting aside the most recent developments, all the evidence suggests that the healthcare infrastructure uh, was and continues to be fairly primitive, particularly outside the bigger cities. And yet deaths do seem to be surprisingly low. And that does suggest there must be some degree of immunity uh, mm -hmm. in the population. Um, and uh, the Vietnam story, yes, I have heard that. And people say that, that you know, some people say, well, these various uh, COVID-like viruses have been around um, for many years. Um, it's interesting, and as I said earlier, there's an awful lot about the way human immune systems work, and particularly work among different ethnic groups. 
uh, that we still don't fully understand. But I think the very low death rates, certainly in Myanmar, even Vietnam, Vietnam certainly does have, as I said earlier, a much better public health infrastructure, I think, than either Cambodia or, or Myanmar. Uh, but even there, uh, they seem to have coped surprisingly well. And that does suggest some degree of immunity. Or, you know, the public health infrastructure is better used to dealing with respiratory problems. Uh, I know there was a lot of concern in Indonesia when all this broke a year ago and people pointed to the so-called Puskas Mas, the community health clinics, that the government has been building now for many years. There's supposed to be one in every sub-district, Um, but they're very poorly equipped. In fact, recently I read that about 20% don't even have fridges. Uh, so how are they going to store vaccines? Um, and plus the fact that, you know, there aren't necessarily the skilled health personnel available uh, just to inject people. Um, and uh, I think what will happen in Indonesia is there'll, there'll be mass programs in a few big cities, uh, but they won't necessarily extend to rural areas or even smaller towns, particularly outside Java. Okay, so we, so that's good. That leads us on nicely to the next question, which is about Indonesia from Nuraki Aziz. In relation to Indonesia, how big is the, is the influence of Islam in addressing COVID there? Do you see the present government's more business-like policies um, as having a negative impact? Again, very interesting. I'm not sure I'm the right person to ask about. I will make a few points if I can. Uh, there is some evidence. Uh, I know even prior to the pandemic, certainly public health officials in, in Indonesia were very worried about vaccinations, uh, for example, vaccinations of um, babies and young children uh, against the measles and mumps and polio. Um, the government policy again is to get children uh, under the age of 24 months fully vaccinated. Um, some parts of the country that policy is working very well. Bali, for example, uh, I think something like 98%, uh, according to the government figures, 98% of children uh, or babies under the age of 24 uh, four months were being vaccinated. And apparently the parents needed very little persuasion to bring them uh, to clinics. Uh, but if one looks at some of the more Islamic areas, Aceh, of course, stands out. Uh, there seems to be much more resistance to vaccination. Now, some people are arguing this is because of rogue policies, and these are certainly not official policies on the part of, you know, for example, the um, Islamic Council in Indonesia, but uh, some uh, KIA in some areas are putting out messages across social media that these, vaccine, these vaccines, uh, you know, they include pig's blood or, um, the serums are made from, uh, you know, animal, um, uh, uh, what's the word one would use, an animal um, uh, plasma, something like that, mm -hmm. which could come from pigs. Mm -hmm. It's complete rubbish. The government, of course, has made it clear that this is rubbish, but there's always going to be, and particularly in the more, you know, the more Islamic areas, there's always going to be a certain proportion of the population that believes this. Um, you say Jokowi is more business-like, um, and Jokowi famously is now trying to push through these reforms, particularly to the labor legislation, which some people think is driven by, um, quote, um, uh, you know, orthodox or um, uh, economic policies prescribed by the World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there may be a little bit of truth in this, but I, I think Jokowi and many other economists who uh, aren't necessarily fully paid up, uh, uh, neoclassical economists tend to agree that labor market policies have not always been very helpful uh, and need some, uh, certainly some um, modification, uh, particularly, of course, uh, the minimum wage policies and the policies regarding uh, 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 payments for uh, uh, termination of employment, which are very large in Indonesia, and are having, I think, a negative effect on employment. Uh, but Jokowi is pushing ahead with this. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily uh, 
alienating him in terms of the business community more broadly. And of course, you've got to remember these days in Indonesia, the vast majority of people in private business are Muslims. They're no longer. It wouldn't be quite wrong to say that, you know, they were Chinese or Christians. They're not. Um, and uh, I think Jokowi has a lot of support uh, from many people within the broader Islamic community. Uh, but there certainly are people who, for one reason or another, want to cause problems. Um, and as I said, will do so via social media, spreading all sorts of rumors. It's really very difficult for the government, well, any government now anywhere in the world, uh, to deal with, with rumors on social media. Um, and I think it's particularly the case now that everybody in Indonesia seems to own at least three handphones. Um, you know, this stuff just gets spread around so quickly. Um, I don't know what's, uh, what, I sometimes wonder what is happening in Thailand. We'd think um, the current government would be more inclined to try and control social media. Uh, but as far as I can judge, it's not really doing so. I mean, to the extent that silly stories are going around about vaccines, for example, what's the government policy? Just sort of basically shake, you know, say this is silly, don't pay any attention and leave it at that. I think the government is is more interested in looking at sort of possible crackdowns on political activities rather yeah. than questions. So it's still kind of pretty concerned about uh, cases of les majeste, for example, which, you know, for a short while got a little bit out of hand. The lid came off that for a while and now it's been fir quite firmly clamped back on. So I gather. But I don't think, I get the impression in time there's been less sort of anti-vax feeling uh, among the general population. Perhaps Thais have got other things to worry about at the moment. I don't know. Possibly. Um, I don't know either, really. I haven't the, heard much. Uh, and I haven't heard much in Malaysia, which after all, you know, 60% of Malaysians are Muslim. Uh, and yet there doesn't seem to be very much in the way of anti-vaccination feeling. You, you know, and uh, if, if the Sinovac is all that's available, I think many people are prepared to take it. Hmm. And it may be a perfectly good vaccine, no reason to think that it isn't. Um, I know when Jokowi was publicly vaccinated a few months ago, he had the Chinese vaccine. Um, and it is the only one that's widely available. I think some emerged, sorry. sorry. I think some evidence emerged this week that it was the Sinovac was less effective than some of the other vaccines around. The Chinese are not exactly helping themselves by not making the data, but they claim to have carried out tests. Right. It may well be less effective, but still even less effective doesn't mean to say it's useless. Yeah, still worth having. It's still worth having. And yeah. I know the big state enterprise in Bandung, it's, I think it's called Biopharma, um, and that makes a lot, that has in the past made a lot of vaccines for um, uh, domestic use in Indonesia, particularly for polio vaccine and some of the other vaccines against measles, mumps and so on that's being given to, to babies and young children. They are now locally manufactured. Yeah. And I'm told they have a deal now with Sinovac. Right. Um, so certainly in Indonesia, I don't know what Thailand's own capacity for making vaccines would be, but they must have some capacity. They must have some, yes. Yeah. 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 So move on to a question from Thomas Larson. Um, Thomas says, thanks, Anne. It has been argued that the pandemic has accelerated some technological changes. This Zoom talk is an example. To what extent is Southeast Asia experiencing similar technological benefits, benefits in inverted commas? Um, well, I've certainly tuned into several Zoom seminars on a completely different topic. Uh, I tuned into one a couple of weeks ago in Indonesia, uh, organized by the Academy of Social Sciences, looking um, at issues related to um, open access publishing, far removed from current concerns about the pandemic, but is something that Indonesians, I think other people, in Asia are getting uh, quite concerned about. Um, on the one hand, open access publishing seemed to be a great plus 
uh, certainly for Asians who can't necessarily afford to buy expensive textbooks and articles. And those Lancet articles I mentioned earlier um, are uh, available easily as a free download. Many medical uh, articles now are, I think, in fact, probably the majority. And certainly the Gates Foundation and other medical charities are dishing out large amounts of money for open access publishing. Um, certainly my last few visits to Indonesia, and I'm sure this must be true in Thailand, um, Malaysia, Singapore, obviously, but also the Philippines, even now Vietnam, um, computers are becoming much more widely available. Um, and, um, you know, academics and also I think students are much more au fait with downloading stuff from the internet. Not always a good thing. Uh, I suspect some of what they download isn't terribly um, healthy, but um, it does mean that an awful lot of academic publishing now compared with say 10 or 15, <coughs> excuse me, 10 or 15 years ago, a lot of academic publishing now is much more freely available uh, in Southeast Asia. And I think on the whole, that's got to be applauded. That's why I would urge colleagues, if they possibly can, uh, to make sure their articles and even their monographs are available on an open access basis, if, if that's at all possible. Yes. Because um, it, it is making a big difference, I think, across the region. Yes, it's a good point. I'll move on to a question from Tutku Zengin. Thank you for this very informative presentation. I have two questions. Firstly, what do you think of ASEAN's role in the economic recovery process? And secondly, do you believe if Southeast Asian countries can benefit from the rivalry between the US and China or not? And thank you in advance for answering the questions. Well, that's two very big questions and I'm not sure. Let me first say on ASEAN, whenever there's a major crisis, and you know, I think back particularly to the so-called financial crisis of, of the late 90s, many people in Southeast Asia tend to throw up their hands and say, well, what use is ASEAN? You know, ASEAN's done nothing except sit on the sidelines and, and sort of look hopeless. Uh, and there's some truth in that. And I think, again, um, as far as I'm aware, on issues like, for example, availability of vaccines, I don't, I haven't heard anything from ASEAN about this. Um, and again, I think many people are probably thinking, well, what is the use of this outfit? Um, on the other hand, and you know, I've always been sort of mildly inclined to defend ASEAN. I remember a couple of years ago, or rather, um, vocal Thai student told me, this was at SOAS, uh, told me that ASEAN was completely useless and he didn't understand why Thailand <laughs> remained a member. I could see his point of view, but on the other hand, um, it's a, it's, it's a low-key operation. It's not particularly expensive. It doesn't cost uh, the countries uh, a huge amount to join. And I think some have certainly benefited. I would say that about Vietnam. I think Vietnam sees ASEAN mainly in terms of a sort of you know, group of friends that will help them um, uh, when the conflict with China emerges or gets worse. Um, elsewhere in the region, yes, there may be a certain amount of ASEAN fatigue. And clearly the current crisis in Burma is going to put all sorts of problems. Uh, I know there was a meeting, the Indonesian foreign minister, by all accounts, a very competent woman, uh, she flew up to Thailand uh, a few weeks ago to have a sort of a summit with her Thai counterpart and the foreign minister from Burma. Now, we won't, the, from Myanmar, we won't really know, I don't think we'll ever know what was said at these meetings, but I think it was an attempt to try and say, admit it in a fairly low key way that, you know, the Myanmar military just can't expect ongoing support. Um, for its current policies, that things will sooner or later will have to change. On the other hand, you know, there are very pessimistic reports now saying that Myanmar's on the route to become another Syria. Um, and as I say, I think Thailand in particular, although the Thai government's obviously got other things to worry about. Uh, I think the situation in Myanmar is, is going to be a serious problem and they will appreciate support from other countries in the region because are probably not going to get very much support either from the United States or China. I think the United States probably, I suspect, problems in Myanmar are fairly, fairly low down priority 
the worry list, if you like, of the Biden administration, uh, China seems entirely predictably, China seems to be uh, supporting the current regime. But I think, you know, if I was looking into the future and looking at challenges to ASEAN, yes, I think the problems in Myanmar are certainly going to become more serious, probably a lot more serious uh, in, in coming months, years. And it's very, very difficult to see. I mean, some people think that, you know, the government, the, the military now is so immune uh, to any sort of pressure from outside um, that nothing is going to have much effect. But it's a difficult situation that will certainly be a big challenge for the other countries in the region. Mm. Sorry, the second question was more about China, the China-America conflict. Yes. So well, I think one of the good things that's emerged so far from the Biden administration is an obvious attempt to hose down at least some of the problems with China. They're not going to go away. And the Chinese government seems itself to be in a rather more belligerent mood now, certainly was the case a few years ago. Um, to what extent will this worry the ASEAN countries? Well, I think, it, you know, again, every ASEAN country really has a different set of issues when it comes to China. And, you know, I think Vietnam, um, the issues are serious. But then, you know, people say, well, Vietnam's had a thousand years of experience in dealing with China. Um, and, you know, they'll find a way through, uh, which is in one sense, probably true. Uh, but in another sense, I think, you know, and this again, I think is a, a diplomatic issue. Uh, Vietnam would appreciate support and certainly in issues relating to the South China Sea. Uh, Vietnam would appreciate support from other ASEAN members. And I think it probably will get support. I mean, at the moment, Indonesia is sort of sitting on the sidelines because it's not directly involved in the current disputes, but it may well, you know, who knows how far this famous nine dash lines going to be pushed down further into the South China Sea. And if it's pushed down much further, it will affect Indonesia. And nobody quite knows what to do, I suspect. This is another problem that isn't going to go away. Um, and again, I think the ASEAN countries as a group will have to get together and come up with some kind of uh, response uh, that, uh, that makes sense in, in, a, in, a, in the next two or three years and even beyond. But now if I was looking, I, you know, you wanted to sort of push me to say, what are the challenges ASEAN will face? I think clearly the South China Sea is one, but I think also Myanmar and what happens in Myanmar is going to be a very difficult issue and it won't just affect Thailand, it's going to affect other countries in the region as well, including Malaysia and Indonesia. Okay, and I'll move on to what I see is the last question in the box at the moment, and it's a, a second question from Thomas Larson. Uh, if there's time, and yes, Thomas, there is. <laughs> In the US and Europe, there's some evidence that the pandemic has triggered a rethinking of the macroeconomic framework. Governments spend and borrow with no apparent limitations. In light of this, I wonder to what extent the Washington consensus is being abandoned in Southeast Asia. My own view is the Washington consensus never really had that much influence anyway. Um, Southeast Asian countries as a group have tended on the whole to be reasonably conservative uh, in macroeconomic policy. I think broadly that's true of most of them. Perhaps the Philippines has been a partial exception, although even in, I think, recent years, the Philippines has, has certainly gone for growth and achieved re relatively healthy rates of economic growth, but at the same time uh, doing so in a way that doesn't certainly uh, lend itself to the possibility of future crises. Everybody has steered clear of what one might term the Latin American trap or you know, um, even now the Turkish track. There is a feeling, some of you might have seen the rather interesting interview in The Economist a few weeks ago with uh, Mohamed Chapit Basri, who was the Minister of Finance in Indonesia in the second Yudhiyono uh, administration. Uh, and he pointed out that uh, he had to deal with um, 
the so-called, um, what was it, the taper tantrum in 2013, where Indonesia was classified as one of the fragile five, for no good reason that the Indonesians could see, and I think that many other uh, countries, I mean, the Indonesians still tend to feel that, you know, at times they're being penalized for their own good behavior, as it were. Um, I think that's less the case now. Uh, but there's always this worry if we're so dependent on international markets, on capital inflows, uh, doesn't this expose us to vulnerabilities? And I think it does, but you know, I mean, all countries and the ASEAN countries are no exception. They have to weigh up the benefits of being, um, you know, tightly tied to international capital markets uh, against the costs of imposing controls. Uh, now, some people now uh, argue for more controls. I mean, I've even heard quite conservative central bankers saying, well, you know, shouldn't the Indonesians think about more controls or, or you know, aren't they overexposed to these so-called taper tantrums and who knows when the next one's going to emerge? Perhaps some people were worried that the current problems in Turkey would spill over into Southeast Asia. I don't think they will. And so far, there's no evidence that they will. But you know, a lot of these people who sit in London or Tokyo or, uh, or New York and, you know, pushing huge sums of money around the world with the click of the, uh, of the mouse, um, they don't really know an awful lot about what goes on in these countries. Uh, and if, you know, there's a crisis in Turkey today, well, perhaps there'll be one in Indonesia next week. Um, now, one likes to think that markets are becoming a little more sophisticated. Uh, but yes, it does worry me. And then you've got all these you know, very difficult problems about the possibility of a resurgence in inflation um, and what this will mean uh, to the global macro economy. Um, at the moment, one just has to hope that uh, certainly central banks, there's enough coordination now um, that there won't be these spillovers. Um, certain countries, inevitably for political reasons are going to get themselves into difficulties and the current problems in Turkey, as far as I can make out, are almost entirely the result uh, of domestic political problems within Turkey. Uh, but that doesn't mean they won't spill over uh, because, uh, you know, it's quite likely that, that they could. So Indonesia, Thailand, and even now Vietnam, which has become a much more open economy than was the case, say, 20 years ago. They've just got to learn to live with these problems. And this is another reason I think why the ASEAN countries uh, could, as it were, I wouldn't say gang up, but certainly uh, form a block that can deal with some of the likely issues in other parts of the world. Uh, I think that if ASEAN is seen as a more coherent block, this could be beneficial. Um, I hope, you know, I think this business of calling I think it was Ben Bernanke, wasn't it, that came up with this idea of the Fragile Five. Looking back, it was a, it was a completely stupid idea that really was not based in fact, uh, and really revealed nothing except Bernanke's ignorance about, you know, the uh, macroeconomic policy making in these countries and indeed other countries across Africa uh, and Latin America as well as Asia. But it's worrying. I know the, the Indonesians do feel that, you know, in the past they've been punished for good behavior. I think the Thais feel this too. You know, the Thais are still rather sore about what happened in 98. The fact that their so-called friends deserted them in their hour of need mm -hmm. and left them to, uh, uh, to cope. Although they might admit the problems were largely of their own making, you know, they were left high and dry and had to cope more or less on their own. And, you know, even today you talk to Thais that can remember that period and they're still pretty sore about it. And, and so are Indonesians. Um, uh, and indeed to some extent Filipinos. Um, so, and I know people say that, you know, if you talk to high level officials in ASEAN, you always get this sort of underlying resentment. You know, they are out to get us. They don't, you know, they being the Americans or the Europeans or even the Japanese, um, you know, they don't have our best interests at heart. And I can understand that. Okay, well, we don't have any more 
questions in the box. I don't know if there's anything else that you would like to add, and to, or any questions you have for the audience. No, well, thank you all very much. Um, made me rethink some of these questions. As I say, um, I'll, I think the whole issue of the role of ASEAN going forward is an interesting one. It's one one needs to ponder a little more. Um, it's very easy to write ASEAN off. And one sees that very often, uh, as I say, even within ASEAN, let alone uh, other parts of the world. But I do think that, you know, given all the uncertainties and the difficulties going forward in the region, but you know, also in the broader Asian region, not least, of course, in China and China's relationships with other parts of the world, um, the more ASEAN can be seen to be standing together, uh, I think the better for everyone. Uh, and I do hope, I'm, I'm afraid at the moment, deeply pessimistic about Myanmar. Uh, but as I say, Thailand is certainly in the front line. But one just hopes that somehow that situation will resolve itself. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, and then, of course, there are other problems, less serious problems. I mean, I tend to feel the ties will resolve their own problems in due course. I mean, they always have in the past. Um, the, the problem at the moment, I think, is serious because it's inevitably involved constitutional issues regarding the role of the monarchy. And that's different. That's what, you know, is different in Thailand now from even 10 years ago, just like 30 years ago. You know, I can remember the 1970s when the key, you know, intervened in the famous uh, demonstrations in Bangkok. That seems now a long, long time ago. Um, but the role of the monarchy has changed. Mm. Eyes are going to have to come to grips with that and work out a way of dealing with the current problems of the current, you know, the personality of the current king. It's not going to be easy. Well, on that contentious note, <laughs> maybe we draw to a close. <laughs> But uh, thank you very much, Anne, for your time and for, for giving such an interesting and insightful presentation. It's been really, really good to be able to host an event as well and, and get, get back online and get some more activities going for the centre. So thank you very much to you and thank you to Charles as well for, for helping to organise this. Yes. Well, thanks, Charles, also, um, introducing me to the um, details of Zoom. Uh, You're very welcome, Anne. It's, it's been I a pleasure. I feel I know a lot more now than I did a few days ago. Um, That's good to hear. And, uh, yeah, but I hope very much that we can have a few more uh, online discussions and perhaps sooner rather than later actually meet in person. That would be good, wouldn't it? Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs>